We pray that you'll bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you'll surround us with your holy angels. We pray that you'll draw us close to you and that we will not just have an informative time, that we will have a spiritual time together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Right down at the end. Now, I'm going to give you page numbers most of the time. There's a couple of books that I won't give you page numbers for. I won't give you page numbers for Revelation, and I won't give you page numbers for Genesis. You know why? Because Revelation's at one end and Genesis is at the other. They're easy to find, okay? You can all handle that, right? Revelation chapter 17. And somebody was actually asking me a question about this last night. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking into what this passage actually has to say and how it applies to our subject this evening about world our world under pressure. You know, the interesting thing that I find whenever you speak to somebody who has a prediction about the end of the world, there is one thing that they all have in common. They all have in common that they predict doom for the end of the world. You ever notice that? Everybody who is predicting the end of the world is talking about doom and destruction. You know, we can think of the, uh, the Mayan prophecy as an example. I think that finishes, what, in just a, about two months' time from now. And they're predicting all kinds of doom and destruction for the end of the world. And we could go on and on down through the list. It's a, it's a theme that seems to run throughout end-time predictions. The incredible thing about Scripture is that Scripture actually predicts the complete opposite You see, the prophecies of the Bible point to hope for the end of the world, point to the end of evil, the end of destruction, the end of pain. And that's a good thing. Now, if we look into our passage here this evening, Revelation chapter 17, I want you to notice here, we're going to read a passage in uh, verse 12, and we're going to move through this fairly quickly, because we're going to cover some of the details in more detail in a future presentation. But beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Then it goes on. And that says, these shall make war with the Lamb. Now, the Lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, when the Bible speaks about war with the Lamb and then the Lamb overcoming them, that is a reference to the end of the world. And so here we have an event taking place just before our world comes to an end, just before the return of Jesus Christ. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what's actually going on here? What's it talking about in this passage? There are a number of symbols, and one of the things that I love to, I love to study into is symbols. Symbols have always fascinated me. You see, symbols are such a powerful way of communicating. In one symbol, you can contain all of the information that you'd find in an entire book. All right, let's run through it very quickly. The Bible says in ten horns, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Ten in the Bible is a symbol of the whole world. You'll find that the image of Daniel chapter 2 that we spoke about last night, ten toes. Then you go to Daniel 7, ten horns. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, you've got ten virgins. Here you've got ten kings. And we could look at other places in Scripture. A symbol of the whole world. Kings is language that we understand. The Bible is speaking about the political leaders of the world. Notice the Bible says 10 kings, that's plural, right? 10 kings, plural, which have received no what? Kingdom, is that plural or singular? That's singular, isn't it? So what we have taking place right here is a global gathering together at the end of time just before the return of Jesus Christ. Today we call that globalism, isn't that so? Do we have globalism in our world today? Yeah, absolutely we do. The Bible speaks about it in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, and here it talks about what is the driving force behind globalism. If we go to verse 13, 
where it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and, mark this well, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And so we have a global gathering together. Now, I want you to notice how it takes place here in this passage. The Bible says that you have three unclean spirits. They come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, if you want to know who the dragon is, who the beast is, and who the false prophet is, you're going to have to keep coming to this series of presentations because we will show you exactly who they are. And we will name names. It will be that specific. I'll make you that promise. Let me say this for this evening. These are religious in nature. And notice who they go out to. They go out to the kings of the earth. Isn't that so? That is the political realm. Isn't that so? So what is the driving force behind the politics that is taking place here in this passage? The driving force is religion. You notice in Revelation chapter 17, they have one mind, one purpose in mind, to give their power and their strength to the beast. That is a religious entity. You see, religion is the driving force. And the reason that I find this very, very fascinating is because when you study history, one of the things that you find is that nothing changes. Century after century after century, the same thing takes place. And if you understand history, and that's why I congratulate you guys here for actually taking an interest in history. If you understand history, you can understand what is taking place in our world right now. You know, symbolism is a fascinating thing. If we go back to ancient Egypt that we were speaking about last night, ancient Egypt was an empire built on the principles of globalism. And what was the driving force in ancient Egypt? Why do you build a tomb like this? Why do you put so much effort into it? The answer is very simple. Their religion drove everything that they did. Religion was the driving force. And of course, the pyramid was a symbol of the descending rays of the sun. We talked about sun worship last night. And our sun worship is universal around our world. We talked about the origins of it, originating in Mesopotamia and spreading around the world from there. The pyramid was a symbol of the descending rays of the sun and the pharaoh, after he died, this would be a giant staircase where he could ascend to the sun and continue to live. Along with the symbol of the pyramid, you had the symbol of the eye, the eye of Ra. And of course, the eye of Ra was another symbol of Ra, the sun god. And here we have the sun itself, now, it's an interesting thing. If you combine these together, these three symbols right here, let's combine these three symbols, the symbol of the sun, the symbol of the pyramid, the symbol of the eye. We would say, yes, those are all Egyptian religious symbols, wouldn't we? Yeah? And there we find it right there. The eye, the pyramid, and the rays of the sun. Isn't that so? This is a very, very ancient symbol. Here we have uh, it in modern use today. You find it used in secret societies like uh, the Freemasons and the Illuminati. We're going to talk more about secret societies. But here you have it going back to an Assyrian medallion thousands of years ago. Same symbol. So what is it all about? Well, what I find interesting is what it reveals to us. And what it reveals to us is this. In thousands of years, nothing has changed. The ancient empires that were built on the principles of globalism mirror our world today, how it is built on globalism. As religion was the driving force back then, it is the driving force right now, and you don't have to scratch very 
far beneath the surface to find it. And what's more, you will find that the same religion that was the driving force in ancient Egypt is the driving force right now. Take this symbol, for instance, and look at where it pops up in all of the most unusual places where you would not expect to find it. Now, we know that this is an Egyptian religious symbol, and yet we find it popping up in all kinds of Christian places. Now, I'm a Christian myself, and so... It makes me wonder, this is one sort of a little bit more hidden right there and facing the other way up, why are these symbols cropping up all over the place? Is it telling us that there is another power at work that we may not necessarily be familiar with? Now, when you study the ancient mystery religions, one of the key things that you'll find out is that there was information that was given to the average person. You know, the average person, they were fed all kinds of, you know, keep them happy, keep them relaxed, you know, keep them sitting in their lounge chair watching television, you know, tell them not to worry too much about anything, everything will be fine, don't stress over it, while we do our own thing behind the scenes. And when I see these ancient Egyptian symbols cropping up all over the place, here it is right here, it makes me ask the question, is there something going on behind the scenes that has not been revealed to us? Particularly relevant when you read what Jesus said, and he said, take heed, watch out that no one deceives you, when he spoke about the end of the world. That was the very first thing he said. You know what the second thing he said was? Watch out that no one deceives you, a few verses on. He says, watch out that no one deceives you few more verses on he says the same thing and so we could go on and on you get sick of taking photos of these things after a while they just seem to pop up all over the place and we have a couple more before we finish off but we have to ask ourselves the question why why are they popping up all over the place the answer is very simple the same power that was at work then is the power that is at work right now. Okay, so if this is a sign that Jesus is coming back soon, what did Jesus himself actually say about his return? I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and what you'll find here is the second longest recorded sermon of Jesus. That's page 401. Page 401. The second longest recorded sermon of Jesus in Scripture. And it is all a prophecy and it is all about the end of the world. It is all about our world being under pressure. So let's begin. The Bible says, Matthew 24 and verse 2, Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Truly I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And here Jesus is speaking about the temple. And of course the disciples, they're showing him the temple and they're very proud of their temple. It was one of the the wonders of the ancient world. Massive blocks of stone. Jesus turns and looks at that temple and says, in the future there will be a time when there won't be one stone left standing on top of another. Well, that took their breath away. And in their mind, the only thing that would would bring that event about would be the end of the world. And so they ask him a question. And if we continue on, in verse 3, they ask him a couple of questions. He sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Jesus answered and said, watch out that no one deceives you. Then in verse 5, And he shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And he can go on through it. He repeats himself four times. Okay, so the disciples ask the question, when will this take place, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answers both questions at once. Now, if we work our way down through this particular passage, many people ask me the question, well, when is the end of the world going to take place? Let's go a few more verses down. Let's ask, answer a question immediately before we go any further. In verse 36, Jesus makes a very, very plain statement. And the reason that I want to share this with you is I don't ever want to be misquoted about, all. Oh, I went to this, this seminar the other night and Lyle said that the end of the world was going to be in March the 3rd, 2013 next year. 
Verse 36, Jesus says in his prophecy, but of that day and hour knows how many people? No one. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So if you want the answer to that question, you're going to have to have an interview with God the Father. And we can't do that right now, so we don't know the answer. But does that mean that we have no idea when it's going to take place? Let's back up a few verses. Verse 32, the Bible says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Now, we all know what happens to the fig tree. The house that I used to live in, my neighbor had a fig tree straight out my kitchen window. And I always used to look forward to the time when the buds would come on that fig tree because as soon as I saw the buds on that fig tree, I knew that summer was coming and summer is my favorite time of year. Still don't know why I don't live in this part of the world where you seem to have summer all year round. Ah, you never know. Maybe one day the Lord will see fit to bring me up here. But anyway, okay. So Jesus says, know when you see the signs being fulfilled that it is near, that it is right at the door. Now, one of the signs that we just read about, and we're going to go through the signs that are here in chapter 24 in just a moment, but one of the signs that we just read about was the globalization of our world. Now, it raises a couple of questions. You see, we, both, we read about 10 kings that have received no kingdom as yet, but they unite together. And I want you to notice the nature of globalism. National sovereignty does not disappear, but the nations of the world come together with a common purpose, one purpose in mind, and that is to give their power and their strength to the beast so there is a central point of unity, and that is the beast. Now, how do you accomplish that? How do, you actually, how do you actually control the population of the world? You know, here yeah, I can hear a few people coming up with some ideas. To be able to accomplish what the Bible says right here, you're going to have to strip away some major freedoms and rights. Simple as that. They're going to have to go. Things that we take for granted. By the way, many of them have already gone. You just don't realize it because you've been quietly, comfortably sitting there in your living room watching your television and yawning when you see major events taking place in our world. If you want to control people, it's very, very easy. You control them by fear. Fear is one of the greatest motivators that we have in our world today. And there are three primary areas that people have used, that empires have used down through history to control people. Let's begin with the first one, political fear, international political fear. If you're going to do something internationally... It has to be international. International environmental fear. So in this one, your safety of your person is at risk from war or terrorism or whatever it might be. Here, you are at risk from the environment. And this one right here, international financial fear. Now, I want you to think back over the last 10 years. Have we, have we been... Have we been motivated by any of these issues in the last 10 years? Starting with, let's go back a few slides, 9-11, and then global warming, and where are we right now? You know, it's an interesting thing. If, people control, if somebody can control your pocket, they can control you. Isn't that so? I have people, they come to me times, and they, and, 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 and they say things like, oh, you know, and they get all, all wound up. Over, um, over computer chips being injected into them. They don't need to inject a computer chip into you to be able to control your finances. You know why? Because you all have one of those, right? Yeah? They already control you. That's not money. It's an electronic promise to pay. And what happens when, what happens when you put that in the machine and the electronic promise to pay doesn't pay? You don't get it, do you? It's just not going to happen. They already control our back pockets. We don't need to worry about that much. It's interesting what the Bible says about it. If we go over to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, more towards the middle of the Bible. In the middle you'll find Isaiah. Then you go Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And 
And let me share with you just a short verse right here. Right at the end of time, once again, just before the return of Jesus, the Bible says in verse 43, and here it speaks about the same beast of Revelation 17. It says, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, over the precious things of Egypt, the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Now, we're not going to go through this prophecy in detail this evening, but when the Bible says he has power over gold and silver, is that language that we understand? Yeah, that's wealth. There is going to be global financial control according to the Scriptures at the end of time. Is that simple? You know, it's interesting when we look at our world today and we see what's taking place. Henry Kissinger a few years ago made this statement. He said, today America, speaking about the United States, would be outraged if United Nations troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. Well, how do you accomplish that? This is especially true, he continues, if they were told that there were an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. doesn't have to be real, it just has to be a threat. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by the world government. Interesting when we look around at our world today and we look at the biggest economies that are in our world today, the EU and the United States. How good a shape are those economies in right now? Okay, let's consider, let's consider the EU for a moment. We all know where Greece is at, right? And Greece on its own has the power to bring the whole thing crumbling down. But just a fraction behind it, you've got Italy, Portugal, Spain. You've only got one nation there that is making serious money and is propping up the whole system, and that's Germany. Then we consider the United States. Of course, a lot of my family is in the United States, and I've got to tell you that things are very drastic over there. We do not realize here in Australia how lucky we are at the moment, but let's not get too comfortable because our economy is just as fragile as theirs. And people say, oh, you know, China's a big powerhouse of an economy these days. Well, you know, China's starting to struggle. You know why? Because Europe and America aren't buying their products anymore. Now, if they can control your back pocket and they can motivate you by fear, they can get you to accept anything. It's been proven over and over and over again. Let's consider for a moment where we are at right now. Um, the United States national debt at 6.41 daylight saving time for all the Queenslanders that are here today. So that was just before our meeting began was this number. I don't even know what that number is. That's a long number. But I do know that there is three United States citizens in my family, my wife, my two boys. So that means that I've got a responsibility for this debt of more than $150,000. And that's before we start on the Australian one. Oh, by the way, um, when I did this same presentation a year ago, it was only that much. And I only owed that much per citizen. Um, is Australia any better off? Yeah, we are, slightly. We were a lot better off, but now our national debt, a few minutes later today when I checked, was this big long number right here and per citizen is that much, so I'm nearly up to $200,000 in my family. It pays not to have American citizens in your family sometimes. Oh, and our credit card debt, look at that, that blows me away. Hard to imagine. You know, when we look at Australian credit card spending, um, in 1992, we spent $1.9 billion on our credit cards. In 2002, 10 years later, we spent $21.5 billion, and last year we spent $49.4 billion. Is our population growing that fast? No. We live in a very, very fragile society financially. Let me share with you a couple of other things. Top 200 companies contribute over 25% of the world's economy. The wealthiest 1% of the world now have more wealth than the bottom 95% of the world combined. Of the top 100 largest economies, 51 are global corporations, only 49 are countries. For example, Ford is bigger than South Africa. General Motors is bigger than Norway. Walmart is the 
is the biggest company in the world. And in contrast to that, you get a country like Mozambique that spends 3% of their income on health, 8% on education, and 33% on debt repayment. The money is out there to take care of our whole globe. But in the Western world, we're clutching on to every bit that we can. The Bible makes a fascinating prophecy in the book of James. James chapter 5, verse 1 to 8. See if this describes our world right now. Let's read through it. James says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. And then he goes on and says, You also be patient, establish your hearts, because when you see this kind of situation in the world, you know that Jesus is coming back soon. And so right here in front of us right now, when we look at the economy of our world, we know that Jesus is coming back soon. We could look at so many more aspects of this this evening, but we need to move on. Let's go back to Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 is full of really interesting prophecies about the return of Jesus. Matthew 24, I haven't got to the best bits yet. Okay, Matthew 24, the Bible says in verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And verse 24, There shall be rise false Christs and false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Do we see that happening around us? Yeah? Just down the road? We have Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Just up the, ro- just up the road, I should say. In Kingaroy, in Queensland. Um, who, uh, yeah. And then you have um, um, Howard Camping last year who said that Jesus was coming back on May 21, 2011. We could go on and on and on, couldn't we? Down through the list. We are surrounded by the fulfillment of this prophecy. But that's not where it ends. You see, it continues on. It continues on. If we go back to verse 6, Jesus says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. At this particular time, I have lots of people who come to me and say, well, you know, there has always been wars. There has always been earthquakes. There has always been famines and pestilences and all of these different kinds of things taking place all the way down through history. Isn't that so? Yes. But there hasn't been a time in history where over a period of just 100 years, 180 million people have died as a result of war. That hasn't existed before. And I want you to notice what it says. It goes on, it says, these are the beginning of the birth pains. I find that interesting because I know some things about labor pains. <laughs> By observation. <laughs> I hear someone on the, front, on the front row go, oh, really? So let me share with you what I observed. Three things. Number one. When the labor pains begin, you don't have the choice of saying, it's a really inconvenient time right now, do you? You don't have the choice of saying, you know, no, I'd rather have this baby next week. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You have begun a one-way path through pain to a blessed and beautiful event. Isn't that so? That's right. So when we, we know that when these things that Jesus spoke of right here, when it begins, it's a one-way path and Jesus is coming back again soon. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So that's the first thing. You can't switch it off. You can't change it. You can't delay it. You're on a one-way path. The second thing is that when labor pains start, they're a fair way apart. But what happens is you get closer to the birth of the child. They get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together. Isn't that so? The third thing 
about labour pains is not only do they start a long way apart, but they start off fairly mild and then they increase and increase and increase and increase and increase in intensity. Isn't that how it works? Yeah, I can see some of the ladies nodding their heads. They know what I am talking about. Okay, so here's what we've got. The Bible says these will be like labour pains. So when you suddenly start to see them dramatically increasing in intensity and increasing in being closer together, then you know that it's not far off. And when you see them all taking place simultaneously, when you see things like 180 million people dying in 100 years as a result of war, when you go back 150 years and people were fighting with something like this, and it was up close and personal, and you come down to the present, and people today fight wars from their office chair with radio-controlled drones. Have things changed a little bit in a very short space of time? Indeed they have. You can look at the history of warfare over 6,000 years, and it has barely changed until the last 100 years, and suddenly it has taken a dramatic change. In fact, let me share with you a couple of other passages along with this. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. See if this, see if this matches up with our world today. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. Revelation 11 and verse 18, the Bible says, And the nations were angry, and your wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to those that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those which destroy the earth. Two things that I want to draw out of this passage right here. This passage, speaking about the end of the world, before our generation could not be fulfilled. Our generation is the first generation where it is actually possible for that passage to be fulfilled. Because our generation is the first generation that actually has the ability to destroy the world. Isn't that so? And we're doing a pretty good job of it, wouldn't you, don't you think? Yeah, indeed we are. But not only that, it says the nations were angry. Is there anger amongst the nations? Yeah. There's anger amongst the nations. You know, 20 years ago, Heard about somebody who was, you know, doing the, the, the uh, young person thing and hitchhiking around the world and doing backpacking and all that kind of thing, and they, they hung an American flag from their backpack so that they would be safe wherever they went. I worry about my family. They have American passports. It scares me. A lot of countries in the world where you wouldn't go with that passport these days, isn't that so? Is there anger amongst the nations? Oh, yes, there is. I want you to notice something, a contrast here. Go back to 1 Thessalonians, page 477. Page 477, 1 Thessalonians. Notice the contrast here. In verse 3, chapter 5, sorry, in verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. It says this, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, or peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And so here's what the Bible, here's how the Bible describes the world. At the end of time, there will be anger amongst the nations, and everybody's going to be talking about peace and security. Is there anger amongst the nations? Do we have the capability to destroy our world? Is everybody talking about peace and security? I hear lots of people all over the place, you know, that we've got to make this more secure and that more secure and something else more secure. Let's go to the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book of the New Testament, page 426. Page 426, beginning in verse 5, it says, There shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations. Do we have distress of nations on our earth? Yeah? Perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Did everybody see the tsunami that hit Japan last year? It feels longer ago than that, doesn't it? It was only just last year. Verse 26, Men's hearts failing them for fear 
and for looking on those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Is there a lot of fear in our world today? A tremendous amount of fear in our world today. But the Bible doesn't just say that there will be wars and rumors of wars. It goes on. It says there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in different places. Let's look, at, let's look at some simple facts. Up until the 19th century, there were 2,119 recorded earthquakes. Ten had registered more than six on the Richter scale. Now we have 3,000 every year. 1.5 million people have died in the last 90 years as a result of earthquakes. 75% have taken place in the last 14 years. We could go on and on down through the list. We have a long list of earthquakes that have taken... In fact, earthquakes have become so common today that within a week of a big one hitting, we've forgotten about it. I guarantee you, if I gave you a list of all the big ones that hit in the last two years, you'd probably remember about two of them. Okay, what have we got here? Geological disasters in the last 100 years. Does anybody see a pattern there? Yeah? Hydrometeorological disasters, storms and floods in the last 100 years. Anybody see a pattern there? Biological disasters, that's pestilences in the last 100 years. Anybody see a pattern here? This is all taking place in the last 100 years. Does this sound anything like what Jesus was talking about? And that's all of those uh, three combined together. Now, Let's consider this one for a moment. The Bible says there would be famines at the end of time. One-sixth of the world's population faced starvation. 3.5 to 4 million die of starvation every year. Every day, 35,000 children die of hunger, malnutrition, disease. That's one every two seconds. For the first time ever in the history of our planet... We had more people dying from overeating than undereating. And so while the third world starves, in the first world, we are eating ourselves to death. Is something wrong with our planet? Yeah. Here's something else to consider. Think about this. The population of our globe in the time of Christ was around 250 million people. It took 1,900 years to reach 2 billion people. Then it took 75 years to reach 4 billion people. Then it took 25 years to reach 6 billion people. And now, nine years later, we are climbing through 7 billion people and more. Now, the simple reality is that the resources that our world operates on are not renewable resources. We all understand that, right? We know that something has to take place. Anybody who stops and thinks about it, anybody who does the research, knows that something great and decisive is about to take place in our world. Let me show you something else from Matthew chapter 24. Back to Matthew 24. By the way, you should um, mark this one or turn the page down or whatever because we're going to spend some more time in here. Matthew 24, Jesus says something else. In verse 37, Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what were the days of Noah like? Genesis. Now, I told you where Genesis was, didn't I? Where's Genesis? Genesis chapter 6. Let's find out. What were the days of Noah like? Genesis chapter 6. And notice with me verse 5. The Bible says in verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Bible says, and in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, The love of many will grow cold. Let me show you another one. Go to Timothy. Not sure whether I marked this one down or not. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. I don't have the page number. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 
beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now let's put all of this together. The Bible talks about a moral collapse just before the return of Jesus Christ. And so we ask ourselves the question, is there a moral collapse taking place in our society? There was a, a survey that was done in 1940 to find out from school teachers what were the issues in school perpetrated you know, by the students that created the greatest the stress, you know, their day-to-day -day problems, the things that stressed them out the most. And in 1940, the issues were talking out of turn, chewing gum, this was an American survey, um, making noise, running in the hall, cutting into line, dress code infractions and littering. Well, in the year 2000, somebody dug that old survey out and they gave exactly the same questions to a group of teachers. And by the way, that was in order of priority. And here it comes in order of priority in the year 2000. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery, and assault. Has anything changed in the last 50 years? Our world has changed dramatically. You know, we look at uh, the way we're being entertained, and I'll probably talk a bit more about this at a later time. We look at what things are taking place on television, the way we entertain ourselves. It's no wonder our world is turning itself upside down. Last year we had this particular individual here who went out and killed a whole bunch of people. You know, I find it fascinating that if you go back 50 years, the civilian population of our world was literally awash with high-powered military-grade weapons. They all brought them home from the Second World War. And you didn't have people going crazy and going around and killing lots of people. My wife went to the United States and the boys in August to visit the family, try and get over there once every year or a couple of years or so. It's nice when they can do that. I dropped them off at the airport. And as I'm pulling out of the, you know, the area where you drop them off at the airport, you give them a the hug and kiss and say goodbye and feel sad and pull away because you're going to be batching it for a whole month and <laughs> switch the radio on. And the news was on. And in Wisconsin, where they were traveling to, there had just been a mass murder. God had gone into a, 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 a Sikh temple and killed a whole bunch of people. And I'm thinking, I called my wife. She's standing in line to the check-in. She's flying out to Wisconsin. What kind of a, what, what, what has changed? Maybe we should look at the way that we're entertaining ourselves. You know, the, the, other, the other very sad thing, and, and, and this, this troubles me more than anything else, and I've got some stats here somewhere. Um, since 1970... Marriage has dropped by 30%. Divorce has increased by 40%. And our world has more singleness than it has ever seen before. There is more singleness now than our world has ever seen before. And what's been the results of that? Depression is a pandemic that we're facing here in Australia. One in three people, one in three Australians are suffering from depression. And that number is rising and rising and rising. Our world is a mess. You know, the good thing is, there is a solution. And that solution is just around the corner. And that solution is the return of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, friends. You know, I, I know I'm sharing some, some heavy things here this evening and some things that make you stop and think and go, oh, wow, that's, that's really heavy stuff. But the reason that I'm sharing some heavy things with you this evening is because these heavy things come with a promise of good news that it is coming to an end. 
The Bible says it would be like birth pains. They would increase in intensity, get closer together just before the arrival of a blessed event. Let me share you one, one, one or two more signs very quickly. Um, Daniel, chapter, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And we'll read here verse 4. Daniel is given specific instructions. He says, but you, O Daniel, this is the angel speaking to Daniel. The angel says, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Well, what's going to happen in the time of the end? The Bible says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Now, the passage here specifically refers in relationship to the prophecies of Daniel. But I want you to consider and ask this question for a moment. Has knowledge increased in our world in the last 100 years? Did you know that in the area of science, 80% of all scientists who have ever lived are alive right now? We know more about our world than we have ever known before. The Bible says that knowledge would increase and men would run to and fro. Let me give you an example. Take a wheel and go back in history 6,000 years. How fast can that wheel turn? Let me tell you how fast it can turn. It can turn as fast as a horse can pull it. Isn't that so? Put it on a chariot and drive that horse as fast as you can, and that's the maximum speed of that wheel. Now go 6,000 years into the future to the year 1800, thereabouts. How fast can that wheel turn? Exactly the same speed. Nothing has changed. Has anything changed since the year 1800? Yeah, 1816, we had the first steam engine, and people were freaked out that once we hit 20 miles per hour, the human body would not be able to withstand the G-forces. <laughs> and now we don't even blink about flying all over the world. The Bible says knowledge would be increased and men, human beings, would run to and fro. Is that happening in our world? Yeah, our world is a pretty small place these days. I talk about my, my wife going back to America. She doesn't always make it, but she likes to go back and visit her family once a year if she can. We wouldn't even dream of that 30 years ago. It's not that hard to deal with these days, is it? Now, I am old enough to remember the first time that I ever saw a computer. I went to this little country school out in the bush in Tasmania, a place called Glen Hewan. And there's three other people here this evening that are from the Hewan Valley. One that was even from Glen Hewan. And our little country school, it, while I was there, it had between eight and 12 students total. That was years one through six. And one day, the big city school that we were associated with, they had like 90 students, bought a computer, their very first computer, and they were so proud of it, they brought it down to our little country school to show it off. It had 7K of memory on the hard drive. We could not believe what this thing would do. You know, back in the uh, late 80s, there were people that were talking about this big computer in Belgium that took up six city blocks. People called it the beast, and oh, we found, that we found the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. People called it the beast. My mobile phone now has more computing power than what that computer had back in the 1980s that took up six city blocks. Is knowledge increasing? Absolutely, it's increasing. Let's go back to Matthew 24. I'm going to show you one last sign. It's the best of them all. Matthew 24 by the way, we could look at a lot more, but we don't have time. Matthew chapter 24, that was on page 401. In verse 14, it says this, and this gospel, that word gospel means good news. This good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. 
You know, the exciting thing about this is that this good news that I'm sharing here this evening, that I'm sharing with you is going around our world in ways that we never dreamt of even 10 years ago. Now we have live streaming through the internet. We have satellite communication. We have, we have a friend of mine who's, who's doing a series of meetings starting in Brisbane in just a few weeks' time, Gary Kent. He does these little God pods, you know, and they're, they're solar-powered. They're dust-proof, waterproof, every other kind of proof, shock-proof. You can jump on them. You can drive your car over them. They have the whole Bible on them. They have Bible studies, and you can put them in any language you want and send them all over the world. People can't even read and write, and they're getting the gospel. Somebody came to me many, many, well, not many, many years ago, but quite some years ago and said, oh, you know, what you're talking about here is impossible because the gospel will never go to the 1040 window where they're all Islamic. It's impossible to preach the word of God there. This is in the early 90s. This was before the invention of, you know, satellite, major satellite communication, before the invention of live streaming through the internet, before, you know, all of these ways. And now you've got thousands of people in the 1040 window who are giving their life to Jesus every day because the gospel is going to them through ways that we couldn't even, even dream of before. And friends, this is the most exciting part because I have to share with you right here, that when I see all of these things taking place in our world, it points me towards something that I look forward to more than anything else, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus is coming back soon. And the reason that I'm looking forward to that is because Jesus is the person I love. Jesus is my friend. He is the one that I want to be with. Tomorrow morning, my wife flies back to Sydney and so for the next few weeks, I'm going to be here on my own. She'll be here for the last weekend again. Yeah, I know, I'm feeling kind of sad about it. But let me ask you, you know, back in Sydney, there's my house and my toys. All men have toys, right? Yeah? Got my four-wheel drive and I've got my boat and, you know, things like that. Now, while I'm up here doing this series of meetings with you people, I'm going to be missing things that are in Sydney, right? Do you think I'm going to be sitting down every day thinking, oh, man, you know, I really wish missed my four-wheel drive? Is that what's going to be going through my head? No, of course not. I'm going to be missing my family, my wife, and my two boys. Why? Because those are the people that I love. And, friends, the reason that I'm looking forward to Jesus coming back soon is because he is the one who gave his life for me. He is the one who could not bear the thought of spending eternity without me. And so he gave that sacrifice, came to this earth. And he did that for every single one of you here. That's the good news that it speaks about right here. That's the best news that there is. Everything that we see going wrong in our world today should remind us this world is about to come to an end. Jesus is about to come back. And that should give us hope and encouragement for the future. Aren't you looking forward to that day? I know I am. If you're looking forward to that day, raise your hand. Praise God. God is so good. Let's bow our heads as we close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these prophecies, for these promises that you're coming back soon. For thousands of years, these prophecies have gone unfulfilled. And now all of a sudden, they are all being fulfilled. We look forward to your return more than anything else. We pray that you'll prepare us for that great day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.